Welcome everybody on the ninth lecture of the anatomy for pharmacy students. Today, the title of the topic will be the descending pathways of the nervous system. Last time, we defined those structures which practically uh, build up and organize these tracts and nerve system. We agreed that the peripheral nerve formed by nerve bundle fibers on the peripheral nervous system. Meanwhile, the tracts were those structures where the nerve fiber bundles are located inside the central nervous system. Contrary to the ascending tracts, the descending tracts receive signal from the higher order centers of the central nervous system, such as the cerebral cortex, and send it via the spinal cord and brainstem toward to the peripheral nervous system. First, let's define those effectors what the human body has. We already revised the body has several types of receptors that sense the temperature, the proprioception, also the pain and the vibration. But we just have two types of effectors, effectors to respond to these outer environmental triggers. One example is the motor end plate, which controls the striated muscle and part of the somatic nervous system. In this case, the nerves terminate on the surface of the muscle fibers and control or activate their contraction, or also can inhibit their function. But usually it's activate. Meanwhile, another big system is the vegetative nervous system, or this is vegetative nervous system, is another type of effector. However, the vegetative nerve plexus Control, controls many, many structures, especially the smooth muscle uh, organized structure and glandular epithelial structures. So by this way, we can control the vessel's contraction, the contraction of some organs. We also can control all of the gland of us, even if it's an exocrine or endocrine gland. This structure, or this half of the effectors, belongs to the vegetative nervous system. However, in the next pictures, we will introduce and revise just the pathways which control the motor neurons, and by that way, the skeletal muscle fibers. Let's have an overview how these tracts or pathways organize. The major pathway which controls the muscles via the lower motor neuron, this is the pyramidal pathway. The pyramidal pathway especially comes from the upper motor neuron of the cortex, from the precentral gyrus, descend via the diencephalon, mesencephalon, pons, and medulla oblongata, then reach the spinal cord segments. At the spinal cord segments, we have two options. It could finish on the lower motor neuron directly or can finish on the interneuron. I need to stress that just 10% of the total number of pyramidal pathway neurons finishing on lower motor neurons and the remaining 90% terminate on the interneurons. Other so-called extrapyramidal pathways, such as rubrospinal, reticulospinal, and vestibulospinal tracts, come from the brainstem and all together terminate just on interneurons. And via the interneurons, will control the function of the muscle and the lower motor neuron. This picture we don't need to memorize and we don't need to know, but it's good to see how the motor coordination controlled by other systems, such as the basal ganglia or the cerebellum. The cerebellum, last time we saw, receiving information from the proprioception, but also get information about the vestibular structures and the environmental cues. 
the cerebellum make a kind of decision and then via the thalamus can control and supervise the upper motor neuron orders or via the brainstem via these pathways also can interrupt the lower motor neuron function or stimulate. Meanwhile the basal ganglia controls those movements where sometimes the cortex function is not definitely necessary or when we have something settings. Like these basal ganglia determine your emotional body language also determine the or could determine the amplitude of the movement, the direction of the movement, and make the decision, shall we move or don't. Altogether, it is important to see the cerebellum and basal ganglia have great influence on the motor neuron systems. Let's see uh, track by track those tracks uh, which has great importance and altogether controls the skeletal muscles of the human body. The largest tract what we need to talk is the pyramidal tract. The pyramidal tract composed by three different tracts and uh, each of them we will revise singularly. The first widest and largest tract beyond the pyramidal tract is the lateral corticospinal tract. The lateral corticospinal tract starts from the precentral gyrus with the first order neuron. The neuron as axon goes through the internal capsule, then moves down via the cerebral peduncle and the pons. And practically at level of the pyramid, become curved and shift to the contra side. This crossing of the neuron fibers or axons so called together pyramidal decussation. After the pyramidal decussation the huge number of fibers together as a big bundle descends via the lateral funiculus of the spinal cord and this bundle here so-called lateral pyramidal tract. This lateral pyramidal tract will innervate the lower motor neuron at thoracic and upper thoracic and cervical segments to innervate muscles such as the biceps brahi. If the first order neuron descend lower level, it may innervate via another motor neuron, the lower body structures, such as the quadriceps femoris muscle. What we need to see here uh, is that the tract is crossing and controls the motor neurons. The major function of this pyramidal tract to control the voluntary movements, especially the fine movements and fine control. We also use this tract or pathway when we start to learning the structures or the orders of the movements. So when I first learned to walk, then I used this one. But later when I already learned, then the extra pyramidal pathways will control my uh, walking mechanism. It's also good to know the lateral corticospinal tract neurons just innervates the limb muscles and controls. And also need to highlight that the upper motor neuron located in the cortex and the lower motor neuron always located in the anterior horn of the gray matter, the spinal cord. The second member of the pyramidal tract is the anterior corticospinal tract. The anterior corticospinal tract also starts at precentral gyrus level goes down the same way until the pyramid of the medulla oblongata. But here won't be closed. Instead of it, descend until the target neuron level and the target neuron level will become crossed via the anterior white commissure and terminates the fiber on the lower motor neuron. These lower neurons, motor neurons located especially at thoracic level, 
and some lumbar segments and innervates the axial muscles. The function of this tract is the same as the lateral corticospinal tract, but we discussed these neurons mainly innervate the trunk and the axial muscles, such as the deep muscles of the back. Here we also find the upper neuron neuron and the lower one. Let's see the last pyramidal tract member. This tract is a corticonuclear or corticobulbar tract. Why? The remaining pyramidal tract members that we discuss terminates at or terminate spinal cord level. However, this tract starts at precentral gyrus and just descends at mesencephalon, then via pons and medulla oblongata. And it do not go deeper than the brainstem. According to its name, this upper motoneuron innervates motoneurons that are located in the nuclei of the cranial nerves. And this tract is so-called corticonuclear tract. As we saw, that level where the nucleus is located, the nerve fibers will be crossed. In this example, I highlight the motoric nucleus for trigeminal nerve. So the first order neuron descend while the internal capsule, brainstem and pons level will terminate at motor nucleus level for the trigeminal nerve. Then the second order neuron or lower motor neuron of trigeminal nerve goes via the trigeminal nerve out and innervates the chewing muscles. Of course, altogether these cranial nerves, via these motoric nuclei, will control the head skeletal muscle, including the eye muscles, the facial expression muscles, the muscles of the throat and the pharynx, plus the tongue, via the somatomotor nuclei for the cranial nerves. Here you can can find the list where uh, we find these uh, motor nerves. The oculomotor, trochlear and abducens nerves together innervate the extraocular muscles and control your eye muscle movements. The trigeminal nerve, facial nerve and accessory nerve together control the chewing muscles, head and neck muscles. The glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve and unfortunately I forget but in the uploaded material I will highlight the hypoglossal nerve together innervates the pharyngeal laryngeal muscles plus the muscle of the tongue. Let's see those tracts which also uh, participating to control the uh, striated muscle movements. However, they uh, work in parallel to the pyramidal pathway. The first extrapyramidal tract will be the rubrospinal tract. The rubrospinal tract starts at mesencephalon level and the major center of this is the red nucleus. These first order neurons comes from the red nucleus level, will be closed at the tegmentum of mesencephalon and descends contralateral side next to the pyramidal Tract. So this tract located a bit medial and forward compared to the lateral corticospinal tract and these fiber bundle together so-called rubrospinal tract. This rubrospinal tract will control the already learned movements and determine the speed direction of the movements. Important to know it activates the flexors meanwhile inhibit the extensors. If we do not inhibit the extensors, we cannot do anything with the flexors. The second extrapyramidal tract is the tectospinal tract. The tectospinal tract origin could be found at superior colliculus level, but we, it's good to know this tract also comes from the retinal level. The majority of the neurons located at superior colliculus or tectum of the mesencephalon crossed and descends in the anterior funiculus of the spinal cord 
and terminates at motor neuron level. The fibers comes together, come together here, so-called tectospinal tract. And the motor neurons, which innervated by the tectospinal tract, innervates neck muscles. What is the function for this tract? It's interesting. Sometimes, and we can say that it works a little bit reflex level. What do I mean? Many times we realize that some object enters to your visual field or view of your eyes. For instance, if a mosquito enters to your visual field, many times without any control, you need to check what entered to visual field, reflex level. This movement controlled by the tactospinal tract. So if a small, sometimes annoying object enters to your field, visual field, you need to check it first, what is that? However, if a large ball uh, tries to hit your enter to your visual field, usually we uh, turn away our head from this object. So since this uh, pathway receiving information from your visual uh, territories and from your retina, it controls the neck muscles according to that what comes to you via your visual field. The third one are the medial and lateral reticulospinal tracts. The reticular formation is a large extended web-like material along the brainstem. We have a part which is located in the pons and the neurons located in the pons level of reticular formation descend in the anterior funiculus and terminating via interneurons on the motor neurons. This tract is so-called medial reticulospinal tract. Meanwhile, the medulla oblongata level, the reticular formation neurons, become crossed on stay ipsilateral and descend in the lateral funiculus of the spinal cord. Both of them terminate at motor neuron level. This outer one is the lateral reticulospinal tract, according to that is located on the lateral side of the structures. What is the function, or what are the functions of this uh, system? Most important, it set the muscle stone at motor neuron level. So we realize that many times when we are stressful or frightened, then the muscle tones of us is very high and our muscles are tense or pretense. Why? If something happening, especially in stressful events, and not like the daily stress, we need to go to exam. Probably you don't want to hit your teacher, but uh, when you are in the forest at night and you're aware that a brown bear could attack you and something strange knows you see, immediately you turn that and you can uh, react. So in those cases, when the uh, body need to escape or run away, any time, any second, we are well prepared. And the muscle tones already prepared for these strange situations. Meanwhile, if you're lying at home in your sofa, you already have eaten three pizzas, then nobody can force you to stand up and run away. You maximum would like to sleep. Since after three pizza and the effects of parasympathetic nervous system and reticular formation, your muscle tone dropped and decreased very low level. So that's why this is important since the muscle tones controlled by motor neurons uh, determine uh, your ability how to react to the circumstances. The medial especially stimulates the trunk muscles and especially the extensor muscles. Meanwhile, the lateral reticulospinal tract especially stimulates the flexors in the limbs. The medial and lateral vestibulospinal tracts would be the last that I introduce. They are located at pons level. In the pons, we can see two times four vestibular nuclei, a superior, a lateral, an inferior, and the medial one. The first track especially comes from the west lateral vestibular nucleus, descends in the anterior funiculus of the spinal cord, 
and forming the lateral vestibular spinal tract, innervating the lower motor neuron. Meanwhile, the medial vestibular nucleus is the place where the medial vestibular spinal tract starts and descend in the anterior funiculus and finishing on the lower motor neurons. Meanwhile, the lateral vestibular spinal tract is ipsilateral. What is meaning is uncrossed. The, vest, the medial vestibular spinal tract is uncrossed and crossed parallel. So you can say it's bilateral. Both sides innervate uh, motor neurons. We also need to see and know uh, the medial vestibular spinal medial vestibular nucleus also gives fibers which terminate somatomotor nuclei lever for uh, oculomotoric nerves. I mean in that those nerves which uh, control the eye muscles, especially the oculomotoric nerve, trochlear nerve and abducent nerve, receiving fibers from uh, the pontine vestibular nuclei. What is the importance? These tracks all together uh, control the muscles. The lateral one especially activates uh, when we fall or practically during falling I try to save my head from a heat. So practically we sometimes explain that way they activate the anti-gravity muscles to not collect any injury. Meanwhile the medial vestibular spinal tract controls the neck muscle movements and eye muscle movements. Why does it important? If I want to catch something, anything which is moving, parallel I also need to run. I'm tilting my head, so I cannot lose the object, so I need to fix my visual axis. But if I turn my head and I do not or won't move my eye muscles, then by turning of the head my visual axis will be changing. However, if there is a system which always compensated, for instance, if I tilt back my head and turn down my eyes, then I can keep the visual axis and I won't lose the object what I want to catch. This tract that controls these movements is the medial vestibular spinal tract and the so-called uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus. If you don't know, no problem, just I want to you to see that these uh, neurons play a crucial role to control your eye muscle movements with the neck muscle movements. Let's see some functional remarks regarding to this uh, somatomotoric and motoric coordination. As is so in case of the sensory homunculus, we also would or can draw and visualize a motoric homunculus. Is a little bit different the sensory one, however they are very similar. In this case I visualize what are the representation of body organs, skeletal muscle level in the precentral gyrus, where the first order neurons or upper motor neurons we could find. As you see the largest representation we have for the hand and the thumb and the face with the tongue. So practically the finest movements is clean. We can carry it out via your hands and fingers and your tongue. We also need to stress that the corticospinal tracts do not receive fibers just from the precentral gyrus. It also give fi get fibers from the sensory cortex I mean from the postcentral gyrus and from the supplementary motor cortex that is located here in the frontal lobe. Especially here we can find those neurons which also create the plan of the movements. This spinal cord somatotopy is not definitely you should to know, but for interesting I introduce it. So we have certain orders or motor neurons which innervate the muscles. Those who located lateral side of the anterior horn, they mostly innervate the distal located muscles, especially hand and foot muscles.
We mind those who located median side, they mostly innervate the trunk muscles. And we still have an order. Let's see it. The lateral most uh, uh, mass, uh, lower motor neurons innervate the flexors of the hand. One step medial or forwardly, the motor neurons innervate the extensors of the hand. Then the next uh, population of neurons innervates the flexors of the forearm and after the extensors of the forearm. If I move more medial, I will see the extensors and flexors of the upper arm. And finally, I see the flexors and the extensors innervation of the tongue. The same composition and orientation I can found at lower spinal cord levels. So medial most we can see the innervation for the flexors and the extensors. And after gradually as I come much more lateral and back, first we have the flexors of the thigh, extensors of the knee, then we have the flexors uh, again, then we have the extensors of the foot, and of course, uh, Again, extensors and flexors. The internal capsule is uh, practically a part of the brain where all of the pathways practically located together. What do I mean? Here we can find the striatum or corpus striatum. Here we can find the thalamus. Media to them the two, this uh, green and bluish structure indicates the lateral ventricles for the telencephalon. Between the striatum, nuclei and thalamus, we can find white matter where we uh, can detect the ascending and descending pathways. This is a crucial point of the brain since here we can find those information which reach the cortex or comes from the cortex. So if here we have a damage, practically we cannot functioning since the cortex do not have any connection with the lower centers. In this triatum, especially anterior mostly, the largest tract is the frontopontine tract. In the frontopontine tract, intermingled in these fibers, we can find the anterior thalamic radiation. In the genu of this internal capsule, we can find that corticonuclear tract that receiving information from the cortex and send it toward to the brainstem somatomotonic nuclei. Just behind to that, you can see the corticospinal tract that innervates your body skeletal muscles. After these tracks, we can find the superior thalamic radiation, and then we find three different tracks, which come from the parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe, to communicate with the cerebellum via the pons. These tracks are the parietopontine, occipitopontine, and temporopontine tracks. Finally, a little bit back to the thalamus, we can find the posterior thalamic radiation. The Medial part of it represents the optic radiation. We send the information from the thalamus toward to the visual cortex. You will revise with the eye and function of the visual pathway. On the lateral part, we can find the acoustic radiation. We send the information from the thalamus to the auditory cortex. This we will revise when we learn the sensory organs, in this case, the ear and inner ear. Also, I stress in the first uh, pictures that we have signal integration at lower motor neuron level. What does it mean? Here you can find the lower motor neuron. We agree that from the pyramidal pathway, some fibers may finish on the motor neuron. But other tracks, especially extra pyramidal tracks and other tracks, for instance, which coming from the sensory neurons, will finish and terminate on interneurons. And this information, when becomes summarized, will uh, transfer toward to the motor neuron direction. On one motor neuron, thousands of synapses you could find. And this integration have 
to a little bit decrease that amount of information which would terminate on the motor neuron. So make it easier the decision. Since several tracks may stimulate, meanwhile others uh, would like to deactivate some group of muscles and of course the summarized effect of them will be the final uh, effect. Also do not forget that not all tracks innervates each spinal segment. What does it mean? The tectospinal and vestibulospinal tracks I can find here in the anterior funiculus. And indeed they innervate via interneurons, motor neurons. But these tracks you can find just at cervical level. So this is a very ideal picture which could be found just in the cervical levels since the uh, rest of the tracts just could be found in some segments. Meanwhile, in majority of the spinal segments, we can find just the pyramidal tracts, the rubrospinal tracts, the reticulospinal tracts, and the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Here we also would like to introduce shortly what are the functions of the basal ganglia and what they are doing with the cortex and cortical motor neurons. The cortical motor neurons, especially uh, which could be found in the precentral gyrus, they are those neurons who finally ordered what the motor neuron should to do. But we need to create plans and uh, we need to set plans where practically sometimes easier to involve something uh, lower ordered centers. How does it work? The cortex sends information or activates the neurons in the corpus striatum. From the striatum we have two options. Inhibitory neuron inhibit the globus pallidus inhibitory neuron. If this neuron inhibit the second order neuron, this won't be inhibit anything. Thus, the thalamus stimulatory neurons can continuously stimulate the cortex. So the movement is low and you can move. But we have another option. Inhibitory neurons terminates in the outer part of the globus pallidus where we also find inhibitory interneurons. The inhibition of these inhibitory neurons will free these activatory neurons in the subthalamic nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus activatory neurons will increase this inhibition. If these are inhibit the thalamus, the thalamus cannot activate the cortex. So the movement will be aborted. So according to this system, uh, we can stimulate or award some uh, executive orders, which could be important. What is the role of the substantia nigra and especially its compact part? The compact part of the substantia nigra contains dopaminergic neurons. These dopaminergic neurons facilitate the stimulation of the cortex via the thalamus. So the first pathway will be stimulated. Meanwhile, it deactivates the longer pathway. So this way, the substantia nigra uh, facilitate or have the activation of the cortex and activate the movements. Meanwhile, uh, also inhibit the inhibition of the cortex. Here we just have a summary how and which uh, centers control the motor neuron and the function of the motor neuron, thus uh, the skeletal muscle function, especially via interneuron level. From the cortex, the pyramidal tract simulates the motor neurons, meanwhile via the tectum, the tectospinal, reticulospinal tracts from the reticular formation, via red nucleus, the rubrospinal tract, and via the vestibular nuclei, the vestibulospinal tract controls the motor neuron. But we saw that these higher order centers also receiving information from different high, much more higher order centers that determine what will be the response of these uh, especially brainstem structures. Moreover, uppermost, of course, the cortex and the cerebellum will decide what should to do 
with the help of the thalamus. So for instance, the cortex could ask the cerebellum what about the proprioception, so what about the muscle tones, what about the tension of the uh, tendons and uh, joints, and according to that, with this information, the cortex can make a plan with the basal nuclei how and what shall we do from that position to carry out that movement. This is just a summary how it would work. And finally, let's see some medical cases or case reports. But we should to know, uh, usually the symptom of dysfunction or loss of function are paresis or plagias. One is the total function loss, one is weakness. This weakness could affect just one extremity, both lower extremities, one side, both extremities, or all extremities of the body, which in this case usually uh, involve the trunk as well. The background or causes of these uh, plagas and paresis could be stroke, especially at internal capsule level. So when I show and introduce the corticospinal and corticonuclear tracts, uh, if we have a stroke, the contral side of the body totally will become palsy. Inflammations, autoimmune disease, tumors, and other traumatic injuries also could cause uh, function loss of these tracts and motor function. Also, important and common disease, the Parkinsonism. During Parkinsonism, we have difficulty to start moving. So practically, it's very difficult to start to walk or just induce any movements. Or if you already start moving, it's extremely fragmented, always stop and become rigid. Why does it happen? In this case, the number of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra decreased. That way, the longer inhibitory uh, pathway will be the major output of the basal ganglia, which mostly start uh, to stop that movement rather than induce it and stimulate it. There is also a beautiful example uh, during infections like in Zika virus, virus induced guillain barre syndrome. In this case, the motor neurons uh, myelin sheet will be uh, destroyed or broke down and a kind of demyelination will start. If that happening, uh, usually we have a transitional palsy for just one part of the human body, one limb, or just one side. Thanks to the God, many cases, if we treat in time, we can gain back the function. However, after stroke, we also have possibility to gain back some function, but in a big territory affected stroke, uh, the possibility to gain back all function is much more decreased. Another typical example is the brown sequar syndrome, what we already uh, discussed last time. So half side, if you have total lesion or cut one level segment of the spinal cord, such as this level, on the injury side we, side, we have absence of fine touch and proprioceptive feelings. Contralateral side, there is absence of the pain and temperature feeling. What I haven't highlighted last time, we have total loss of muscle function. What does it mean? The majority of the tracts and pyramidal tracts comes from the brain, become closed, and innervates contralateral muscles. If we have a lesion, before or even after the crossing, these pathways cannot control these muscles. So just above the lesion, and the same side, we still have some function. So. That's what I would like to introduce during uh, today's lecture. And finally, some uh, aspects I would like to highlight. Meanwhile, the pyramidal tract control the fine movements, especially when we first learn walking or learn a new introduced movement. So if you have a new workplace and introduce something movement or uh, state, what you never do, like uh, for instead <coughs> fix a small watch, 
and just change some small particles in it, what you never done, you pay attention. And if you use a pyramidal tract, you have practically an ability to pay attention for something other thing. Meanwhile, if uh, we use extra pyramidal pathways, such as cycling, during cycling you can talk with your friend next to your neighboring cycle and you do not pay attention for cycling. Also the same if you're writing or creating notes and scripts during the lecture, you can pay attention for the lecturer instead to that what you're writing, since you already can write and your text knows how to write it and you don't need to visu visually check these structures. Okay. Finally, I would like to say thank you for attention. Good luck for the exam. And I also give you some summary questions which make easier or force you think why these neurons and their functions are important. Thank you for attention again.